In the 19th century, J.B. Lightfoot voices the opinion of many who delight in this brief letter to Philemon. He wrote, as an expression of simple dignity, of refined courtesy, of large sympathy, and of warm personal affection, the epistle to Philemon stands unrivaled. Donald Guthrie says that it breathes the great-hearted tenderness of the apostle. As heartwarming as Philemon is, it does have its frustrations for the interpreter. It leaves us in the dark about several things we would like to know to understand more fully the circumstances behind this letter. Reading Philemon is like coming into the middle of a movie and having to catch up on who the characters are and what has already happened in the plot and then having to leave before the end. Paul does not tell us where he is in prison, what the conditions are like, or more to the point, how it happened that Onesimus came under his influence long enough for him to be converted. He also does not tell us why Onesimus fled his master, if indeed he did flee. Because of the letter's ambiguity on this point, some have argued that Onesimus had been sent to Paul by his master on some errand and only had overstayed his leave. Paul also does not state precisely what he wants Onesimus' master to do with him, except to regard him now as a brother in Christ. A student of ancient papyrus letters observes that he knows of no parallel in the ancient papyri that is as long as this one or so oblique, so faltering, that one has difficulty in determining what it is precisely Paul requests. From the letter, we know only for sure that, that it was written during his confinement and Paul had converted Onesimus. But there is no hint that Onesimus was a fellow prisoner. We also learn that Onesimus has been useful to Paul and served him in verses 11 and 13, and that before he had been useless to his master in verse 11, and he may have even done him wrong in some way according to verse 18. Paul sends him back with this letter in hopes that Philemon will do a good thing in verse 14, and will receive him graciously as a brother in Christ in verses 12, verse 17. But he also expresses the confidence that he will do even more than what Paul asks in verse 21. When we interpret the letter, we must fill in the gaps and make some assumptions about the situation. Two important questions need answers. What brought Onesimus to Paul? And what was Paul requesting Philemon to do when he sends Onesimus back? Well, the traditional view is that Onesimus was a runaway slave. As slaves were wont to do from time immemorial, Onesimus may have fled from his master, Philemon. Somehow, voluntarily or accidentally, he fell in with the apostle Paul who is able to win him to the faith. Scholars in this century have challenged this traditional scenario, and they call attention to the absence of any explicit mention in the letter that Onesimus had run away or of the need for his master to forgive his slave's flight. They also note that it would have been an astounding coincidence for a fugitive slave to meet Paul, the one person who knew his master during his imprisonment. For a slave to run away was a grave crime that the authorities in this era treated seriously. As a Roman citizen, Paul could have been given more freedom in his confinement. A captured runaway slave, however, would have been clapped in irons and kept under guard in a slave prison and not allowed free contact with Paul. How then could he have been of service to Paul, according to verse 13? If Onesimus were not a prisoner and had a freedom of movement, he could have done much for Paul. 
But how and why would he have had contact with the imprisoned Paul? We can only conjecture. Perhaps something other than happenstance brought Onesimus to Paul. But it may be that Onesimus was not a fugitive slave. It may be that he came to Paul in prison because his owner sent him there on behalf of the church in Colossae. But if Onesimus were not a Christian before he met Paul and was regarded as useless, according to verse 11, why would Philemon or the church entrust him with such a responsibility? Why let an undependable slave run loose across the countryside? Why charge a non-Christian with such an important spiritual mission? Was he the only one Philemon could spare? True, the owner might have sent Paul a worthless slave as a cost-effective but miserly well way to help Paul. Or more positively, he was sent in the hope that contact with Paul might help straighten him out. But both options seem most improbable. What rules against this view is Paul's discreet mention of his willingness to reimburse the owner for any wrong that Onesimus may have done in verses 18 through 19. And his diplomatic description of Onesimus' separation from his master in verse 15, where he says, He was separated from you for a little while. If the church had sent Onesimus, Paul could not have described him in the same glowing terms as he used for the Philippians Epaphroditus, whom he says, You sent to take care of my needs. It sounds as if Paul is gingerly searching in verses 6, 15 through 16 for some euphemism to describe a getaway rather than a commissioning. He only mentions it to hint that there may have been some divine reason behind Onesimus' departure, that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. If Paul could find such a reason, it would help to absolve his guilt in keeping Onesimus so long. But Paul's hesitation in expressing his wish in verse 13, I would like to have kept him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, is also inexplicable if the church had sent Onesimus to serve him. If Paul wants to keep him longer, why does he need to send Onesimus back on a perilous journey home to obtain permission to keep his services, only to have him turn around and head back if Philemon grants him permission to return? Why not send Tychicus with a letter to make the request and keep his services a while longer while he waits for the reply? If Onesimus had been commissioned and sent to Paul by the church, why does Paul worry about how Onesimus might be received when he returns home as he is concerned in verse 17? Paul does not seem anxious that his owner will allow Onesimus to continue to serve him, that he, but that he may not embrace his slave as a brother in Christ. The case is based on an argument from silence that fails to consider rhetorical reasons why Paul does not explicitly mention Onesimus' wrongdoing. He employs extreme tact in this letter, which reveals that he is dealing with a very delicate situation in which Philemon could well react angrily. Yet Paul does allude to past problems. Onesimus has done something wrong to raise the ire of his master, and Paul seeks to intercede. The letter's ambiguity in our heightened sensitivity in this age to Paul's tacit endorsement of slavery had prompted Alan Callahan to propose another radically different story behind the letter. His arguments raise a contemporary issue we must address. Why is it that Paul does not apply the gospel in the case before him to attack the inherent injustice of slavery. 
Paul not only does not condemn slavery for Christians, but he speaks glowingly of a member of the slaveholding class and treats Onesimus' flight as an injury to his master that requires restitution. Alan Callahan, an African-American scholar, notes how problematic this picture was for those African-Americans who endured the tyranny and humiliation of slavery and how it remains a sensitive issue for their heirs today. He cites an example from the diary of Charles Colcock Jones, a white Presbyterian minister who preached on Philemon to slaves in Georgia and was startled by their bitter reaction to his sermon. He writes in his diary, when I insisted on fidelity and obedience as Christian virtues in servants and upon the authority of Paul condemned the practice of running away, one half of my audience deliberately rose up and walked off with themselves, and those who remained looked anything but satisfied, either with the preacher or his doctrine. After dismissal, there was no small stir among them. Some solemnly declared that there was no such epistle in the Bible. Others that they did not care if they ever heard me preach again. If you're familiar with the movie about Harriet Tubman, who frees slaves through the Underground Railroad, it's entitled simply Harriet. The opening scene begins with a reading from a passage in Colossians instructing slaves to obey. This scene is filled with irony. The masters listening in relish this reading that they believe reinforces the status quo and what they believe is their God-given authority over slaves. The slaves in the audience, however, hear it quite differently. They do not regard it as God's words to them. And the scene becomes quite ironic in the setting of the narrative of Harriet Tubman's history as an escaped slave and an ab ab abolitionist and social activists who conducted 13 missions to help other slaves escape. Alan Callahan solves this moral dilemma about Paul condoning slavery by arguing that Onesimus was not a slave, but Philemon's estranged younger brother, who ran to Paul to have him intercede in a family dispute. He points out that nowhere in the letter does Paul identify Philemon, or perhaps Archimus, as a master. He argues that Paul's plea to welcome Onesimus no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother in verse 16, does not refer to Onesimus' actual status as a slave. Instead, it refers to his virtual status in Philemon's eyes. Slave was an appropriate metaphor for one who was socially dead, who had no formal enforceable ties of blood. And Paul simply wants to affect domestic reconciliation, which explains the rich familial vocabulary in the letter. He contends, if Philemon is hospitable toward his brethren in the Lord, how much more incumbent upon him is it to be so toward one who is a member of his own family, as well as a member of the household of faith. He should be able to forgive the foibles of his brother in the flesh. And so Paul's plea in verse 16 is not that he accept Onesimus back as a brother, but as a beloved brother. This carefully argued thesis helpfully raises issues that we must address and shows how the issue of forgiveness lies at the heart of the letter, even though it's unstated. But nevertheless, I think it's a case of special pleading to avoid the unpleasant fact that Paul regarded running away as more wrong than slavery is. Paul does not specifically identify Philemon as Onesimus' master because he does not want to reinforce the master-slave relationship when he asks him to accept Onesimus as his brother in the Lord. I think we should read verse 16 literally to mean that Onesimus was indeed a slave. It's possible that another option is that he was a slave seeking Paul's intercession. 
There's a cogent explanation for how Onesimus joined up with Paul and why the latter said nothing of his running away. Onesimus had deliberately sought Paul out, looking for a sympathetic, influential friend of his master to intercede on his behalf. Because of the slave's low estate, it would have been considered impudent and imprudent for him to plead clemency for himself. Roman law, recorded later in the Digest of Justinian, consistently argued over the years that the slave's attitude of mind decided whether he was a fugitive or not. A slave who had no intention of running away, but absented himself to ask a friend of his master to intervene, was not regarded as a fugitive legally. Onesimus, according to this theory, had provoked Philemon in some way and was due punishment. He hurried to the apostle, his master's spiritual patron, to entreat him to intercede with his Christian master and assuage his wrath. This story behind the letter may explain why Paul thinks his intercession has such a good chance for success. In other words, the apostle does not make a case for a fugitive slave, but for a slave in hot water who is seeking Paul's mediation with his master. Verses 10 through 13 imply that Onesimus has been with Paul long enough for Paul to convert him and to become tenderly devoted to his welfare. But another option. In the ancient world, slaves were regarded as akin to animals, And like some animals, some slaves were roamers. To shift the metaphor, some slaves were like honeybees. They would run off but eventually return to the hive. Another scholar makes the case that the language Paul uses suggests that Onesimus was indeed a roamer. As we noted, the intent to run away was the deciding issue. But how would Philemon have known that his slave this time was merely roaming? The length of his absence may have led him to regard Onesimus as a fugitive, and Paul attempts to forestall him from jumping to this conclusion by portraying him simply as a roaming slave who is now ready to come back home. He only went away for a brief time, and this description of him as once useless to you suggests that it was not the first time that he has strayed from his master. Paul's polite rhetoric in this letter suggests that Philemon did not know the intent of his slave, and his lengthy absence would have caused him to think that he had indeed run away. Paul's trying to convince him that Onesimus was not a fugitive, but an errant slave. His purpose in this intercessory letter is to change Onesimus' status in Philemon's eyes from a fugitive slave to an errant slave to now a Christian brother. How Onesimus came under Paul's orbit of influence, however, remains a nettlesome problem. Either Onesimus tried to escape the bonds of slavery and by some quirk ended up with Paul, or he deliberately set out to find Paul in hopes that this influential friend would assuage his master's anger. It's hard to decide between the two. Slaves frequently ran away, but usually because they had been mistreated in some way, or they had done something to make their masters angry, or they were about to be sold, or they had no prospects of manumission, of of being legally set free. Mistreatment could have occurred even in a Christian household just as sexual molestation and violence can occur in Christian families today. But Paul's praise for Philemon's love and compassion in verses 4 through 6, and his confidence that he will accede to his request in verse 21, leave the impression that Philemon was not some cruel tyrant who would drive a slave to the desperate act of stealing away. On the other hand, if one argues that Paul's place of imprisonment is Rome, It seems unlikely that a slave would travel 1,300 miles from Colossae to Rome to seek a mediator smooth over some dispute with his master. If this was what led Onesimus to Paul, then Ephesus, 
100 miles distant from Colossae is far more likely as the place of Paul's imprisonment. In my estimation, it seems more probable that Onesimus was indeed a runaway slave who providentially came under Paul's influence. This means that Paul writes on behalf of a runaway slave something that is absolutely unheard of in the ancient world. No other examples of intercession for a runaway slave exist, which shows how remarkable it was for Paul to intervene if this was the case. Paul believes that he is sending him back and not the authorities. It is possible that Onesimus escaped detection as a fugitive slave and Paul did not let on to the magistrates in hopes that he might escape rough treatment and punishment when he returned home with Paul's intercessory letter in his hand. His letter is the first word that Philemon has heard about Onesimus since his departure. This unusual situation required the greatest delicacy. He uses euphemisms in his appeal and is careful not to overstep any legal bounds. He says he will do nothing without your consent, verse 14. Understandably, he would want to avoid mentioning the unmentionable, Onesimus' desertion, which brought loss of face and economic loss to his master. He uses a pun to describe Onesimus, a name that means useful, as being formally useless in verse 11. Instead of plainly saying that Onesimus ran away, Paul describes his absence with a passive voice, suggesting perhaps that God's hand was involved. He says in verse 15, he was separated from you for a little while. He broaches the subject of Onesimus' past deeds with a conditional sentence, if he has done you any wrong, or owes you anything, verse 18. Paul does not explicitly ask Philemon to forgive his slave, but the general tone of the letter assumes that he should adopt a forgiving attitude. Paul's indirectness puzzles us. You know, Americans, we Americans are culturally more accustomed to coming directly to the point, not beating around the bush. And we might think that if Paul wants his friend to do something, he should just simply ask him outright. After all, he's an apostle. But social mores required Paul to use politeness strategies to lessen the perceived cost of Philemon's forgiveness of Onesimus. This conciliatory approach required him to maneuver delicately around Philemon's feelings of anger and betrayal to establish a level of mutual comfort that would not cause Philemon to lose face publicly, since his forgiveness of a slave may have been construed as weakness, both by his societal peers and by the other slaves who may, be, may perceive the risk of running away to be diminished. It is also possible that Paul uses vague language in case the letter got into the hands of, other, of the authorities. Paul would not want to take the chance of giving away incontrovertible evidence in the letter that Onesimus was a fugitive and that Paul had harbored him for a period. A coded letter protected all parties involved. So I think Paul seeks to pour balm on any resentment on Philemon's part, to, res to resolve any resistance that would prevent him from doing what Paul requests. He recognizes that one does not go about passing judgment on another's slaves. He says this in Romans 14.4, to his own master he stands or falls. Most parents today would resent someone else, including a close friend, offering unsolicited advice on how to discipline their children. In the first century, most accepted as inalienable the right of masters to do as they please with their property, namely their slaves. They would naturally bristle if anyone else tried to meddle in that relationship. Paul's politeness strategy in this letter eases the tension and diminishes the cost of yielding to his wishes. There is no disgrace in giving way to a friend 
who serves God at such cost to himself. So Paul is not simply using clever tactics to diffuse a volatile situation and to manipulate Philemon. Paul swaddles his purpose in a basic theological conviction about what it means for believers to be in Christ. The key phrase in Philemon is in Christ. It occurs in verse 8, verse 20, and verse 23. In the Lord appears in verse 16 and 20, and unto Christ appears in verse 6. This letter shows how Paul applies this abstract, this mystical concept, concretely to the real world of personal relationships. The caste and honor system that regulated social relations was inimical to Christian ethics. If Philemon yields to Paul's request and does more than he asks, it shows how the truth of the, of the gospel breaks down social barriers and dethrones cultural indoctrination. But the next question is, what did Paul want Philemon to do? Rather than throwing his apostolic weight around to bend Philemon's will to his own, Paul makes his appeal based on his new relationship with Onesimus and his old relationship with Philemon and the potentially redefined relationship between Philemon and Onesimus. Philemon is free to do what his conscience dictates, but the truth of the gospel should inform his decisions as well as his relationship with Paul. In making his case, Paul first stresses his deep affection for Onesimus. He's his child, verse 10, his heart, verse 12, his beloved brother, verse 16. Onesimus has served Paul during a challenging time when he has been encumbered by chains, verse 11. Next, he appeals to his intimate relationship with Philemon. He, too, is a beloved brother, as is Onesimus, but he's also more. Paul describes him as a co-worker in verse 1, a partner in verse 17, one who owes Paul his very life in verse 19. And finally, he mentions the redefined relationship between master and slave created by Onesimus' conversion. As his brother in Christ and equal before God, Onesimus now has eternal worth to Philemon in verse 15. The only specific request that Paul makes is that Philemon welcome Onesimus as if he were Paul, verse 17. Paul wants Philemon to accept this formerly troublesome slave as he would his dear friend, who is now in chains for the gospel. Paul only hints that Philemon should extend the same forgiving love to Onesimus that he had also received from God. Their reconciliation is so important that it overrides Paul's wish to keep the now invaluable Onesimus to help him. Paul appeals to the obligation that friends must reciprocate favors, framing it as a business deal. You owe me, but I will repay whatever financial damage Onesimus may have caused you. He expects that as a Christian, Philemon's favorable response Will spring, will spring from his being in Christ and his knowing the fellowship of the Spirit, not simply that he's returning a favor, tit for tat, and now we're even. But does Paul only want Philemon to allow Onesimus to return to his household without punishment? Since Paul never explicitly mentions that Onesimus ran away or that he was filled with contrition, and since he makes no pleas for indulgence and mercy on Philemon's part, it is possible that Paul does not simply want Onesimus' reinstatement as a slave in good standing. Instead, Paul makes a roundabout request for Philemon to send Onesimus back so that he can continue his system while he is in prison. He doesn't ask on behalf of Onesimus but he asked for Onesimus. Paul hides a deeper purpose of this letter between the lines 
And his cryptic statement in verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask, invites us to ask, what is this even more? It suggests that Paul wants to accomplish more than reconcile a master and a slave who are out of sorts. Since Paul confesses how gladly he would have kept Onesimus by his side to serve him, he allows Philemon to see how valuable Onesimus has become in the service of the gospel. Possibly, Paul wants Onesimus to be allowed to return so that he can continue to minister to his needs, but Paul is never interested in how he might personally benefit. His first concern is always about the cause of the gospel and how it might benefit. This overarching concern for the mission cause of the gospel drives his request concerning Onesimus, and he never identifies the cause of the gospel with his personal needs. I believe that Paul wants Philemon to set Onesimus free for greater service in the gospel, whether he returns to Paul's sides to serve him or not. I think this is the even more in verse 21. I think it is the good thing in verse 20 and verse 14, which the NIV translates as favor. And I think this is what Paul hopes for, but dares not ask outright. If Philemon receives his recalcitrant slave as a brother in the Lord, he will refresh Paul's heart. But he will receive a benefit in the Lord only if Philemon sets Onesimus free for the service of the gospel. Well, perhaps we can see things from Philemon's side, the dilemma in doing what Paul asks. If he felt obligated to set a fr a free a slave who had run away or whatever might have happened and returned as a believer, what would that say to the other slaves that he might have? Would they not think, hey, they might get the, their freedom by following suit? Or what about those slaves who've already become Christians and remain slaves? Should not the fundamental incongruity between being a brother in Christ and living as a master and slave mean that they should all be given their freedom? The dilemma for Philemon is real because of unavoidable social constraints. And Paul does everything possible to ease the perceived cost involved in forgiving a runaway slave. Again, reading between the lines, I get the impression that Paul would like Onesimus to be more than a dear brother and a useful slave to Philemon. He wants Onesimus to join the ranks of his co-workers. In Colossians, Paul makes it clear that he has authorized Onesimus along with Tychicus to make known to the readers all that has happened to Paul. This is in Colossians 4, 7 through 9. In other words, Onesimus has the same responsibility as Tychicus, whom Paul identifies as a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. He identifies Onesimus as a faithful and dear brother. But we learn from the letter to Philemon that he has served Paul faithfully in verse 11. And Paul also asked Philemon to receive Onesimus as his ambassador, as me, in verse 17. For Onesimus to become one of Paul's co-workers, he needs emancipation. It was possible to be a slave and a Christian. It was impossible to be a slave and a Christian missionary who must speak boldly and move freely. From the fourth century, we find the following counsel from the apostolic canons concerning the ordination of slaves. And I'm quoting, We do not permit slaves to be ordained to the clergy without their master's consent, for this would wrong those that own them. For such a practice would occasion subversion of families. But if at any time a servant appears worthy to be ordained to a high office, such as Onesimus appears to have been, and if his master allows it and gives him his freedom and dismisses him free from his house, let him be ordained. This is a very early interpretation of Philemon. 
It assumes that Paul expected Onesimus' master to set him free to become a minister of the gospel and that he did so. I think this is an accurate interpretation. The letter to Philemon reveals Paul's tender humanitarian concern for a brother in Christ and the premium he places on Christians reconciling with one another. But it also reveals how his desire to spread the gospel to the world dominates his thinking, even in a semi-private letter about a reformed and reclaimed slave. So what can we learn that happened next from this letter? We can only guess. But since this, since this letter was included in our canon, we might safely assume that Philemon complied with Paul's wishes. Had Philemon not acceded to Paul's request, why would we keep this letter? We would like to know more. Developing a theory first set forth by Edgar J. Goodspeace, John Knox proposed the captivating hypothesis that the freed Onesimus, who was the same Onesimus who later became the Bishop of Ephesus, that Ignatius mentions in his letter to the Ephesians. Ignatius was the Bishop of Antioch and the, Rome, and the Romans had arrested him and hauled him off to Rome to be thrown to the wild beasts in the arena. The date of his letters are traditionally assigned as A.D. 110. And on the way, his escorts allowed him to meet with Christian emissaries from Ephesus and other towns to, and to meet with Ignatius, and then he sent them back with letters to their respective churches. If Onesimus were 20 years old when Paul wrote Philemon, he could have been 70 at this time. John Knox infers that the former runaway slave had indeed become bishop of one of the leading churches in Asia. Onesimus may have participated in the collection of Paul's letters, and that explains why he included with them this small pearl, his treasured charter of liberty. We're naturally curious to know the rest of the story and want to believe that Paul's intercession was not only wise and justified, but turned out with glorious results. The touching story about a wayward slave begotten and changed, becoming a beloved leader in the church, and collecting and publishing the letters of Paul almost makes me wish it were true, even if it were not. But we should guard against allowing an interesting theory from becoming a pious romance that persuades only because it might bring tears to the eyes. Onesimus was a common slave name, and just because the bishop bears the same name as this slave does not necessarily indicate that the two are the same person. So what happened next? Like so many things we would like to know in the New Testament is really lost in the midst of history. But this brief appeal reveals something far more important. It reveals the power of the gospel to transform lives and relationships. Why is such a short letter consisting of only 335 words that does not seem to contain grand theological teaching that we find in Romans and Galatians preserved in our canon? It is possible that it was included in our canon for one or all three of the following reasons. Church leaders so venerated the Apostle Paul that they wanted to conserve everything from his hand. Or they also recognized it to be an incomparable model of spiritual direction, of spiritual tact, and of love. Or they relished the quite new and luminous way in which Paul approaches and decides a delicate matter arising between a Christian master and slave. I think these last two alternatives are particularly suggestive for the letter's contemporary significance. Paul's letter to Philemon serves as a model of Christian compassion. In many ways, it parallels Jesus' parable of the prodigal son, which captures the gospel in a nutshell. The letter speaks of failure, the need for intercession, returning, forgiveness, and restoration. 
And we, when we read it side by side with a letter to the Colossians, we learn that getting relationships straight is just as important as getting doctrine straight. If we're genuine disciples of Christ, we will relate to our fellow believers with grace, forgiveness, and encouragement. This wonderful but much neglected missive can also give us new appreciation for Paul, the human being. It casts Paul in a quite different light from a prevailing view that he is cantankerous, heavy-handed, a guardian of truth of the gospel, fond of wrangling, determined to blast his opponents off the theological map, a kind of bull in an ecclesiastical china shop. In this letter, we get a glimpse of the real Paul. He does not project himself as the all-wise, overbearing apostles some people think him to be. He makes no demands, bends over backwards to help others do the right thing without offending them. We meet in the letter to Philemon a Paul who sees the best in a runaway slave and a potentially irate master who knows the gospel that takes root and spreads when individuals recognize that they are joined together in Christ. This is a powerful letter of Paul's compassion and the transformation that Christ works in people's lives.